Greetings and welcome to the O-Level Revision Series. In this video, we'll be closing the chapter on logarithms with part 4, where we will look at the logarithmic graph and how logs are useful for mathematical modelling. The success criteria for this lesson would be for students to be able to sketch graphs of the logarithmic function of the form y equals the log base a of x, and to model and solve real-world problems using the exponential and logarithmic function. So far, in part 1, we have learned that logarithms is just another way to write an equation that we know in index form. Instead of writing y equals to a to the power x, where y is the subject, in logarithmic form, I can make x the subject and say that x is equal to log base a of y. You can think of this function as a to the power of what gives me this x. Well, we've also mentioned some special constraints for the log form. For one, the base cannot be 0, 1 or negative numbers, and you cannot take log of 0 or negative numbers either. In part 2, we looked at the five laws of logarithm. Pause the video here and try listing them down and jogging your memory of the five laws. Let's go through them. First we have the product law, then the quotient law, the power law, the change of base law, and lastly the reciprocal law. Then in part 3, we applied these laws to solve various logarithmic and exponential equations. Now before we go into the sketching of log graphs, we need to recall how the exponential graph looks like. When the base is greater than 1, the exponential graph is one that increases faster and faster and faster. It tends to infinity along the positive x-axis. The logarithmic graph is quite similar but it's a reflection across the y equals to x line. So it looks like this green curve here. You'll see that it's increasing, but unlike the exponential graph, it increases slower and slower. The exponential graph has a y-intercept at 1, because a to the power of 0 gives you 1, but the log graph has an x-intercept of 1, that is because log base a of 1 gives us 0. Now just as how the exponential graph has an asymptote along the x-axis, the log graph has an asymptote along the y-axis. This is because as x approaches 0, the log graph tends to negative infinity. However, the graph will never reach the y-axis. It's like asking the question, a to the power of what gives me 0? That is just not possible. Now let's look at the case of a log graph with a base a between 0 and 1. For the exponential graph, it's like halving a number again and again. It's similar to our previous exponential graph, but it's a mirror image along the y-axis. This graph is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, tending towards 0 along the positive x-axis. But in the case of the log graph, once again, we have to reflect this across the y equals the x-line. So this is what we'll get. It starts from positive infinity along the y-axis. It decreases really fast, but then decreases slower and slower. It will also have intercepts at x equals to 1 and y equals to 1 for the log graph and the exponential graph, respectively. Now to help you with the visualization for exponential and logarithmic graph, I've included an applet in the info section below, so let me just walk you through it. So the green curve represents y equals to 2 to the power of x, the exponential graph, and the red curve is y equals to log base 2 of x, the, ex the logarithmic graph. So let's see what happens when I increase the base. Let's see what happens when we reach 10 to the power of x. You'll see that the green curve gets steeper and steeper it increases faster and faster, whereas the red line, it increases slower and slower. So let's see what happens when the base drops below 1. So of course at 1, it's a very uh, trivial case. 
for the case of 1 to the power of x, it's just a horizontal line for the exponential graph. And for the log graph, well, it doesn't exist. We don't take base of 1. But when we drop it below 1, you see that the shape becomes like this. So you can go play around with this graph. Let's also see what happens when I set it of base E. So this is what we will get. Moving on to exercise 1. Sketch on the same axis the graph of y equals to 2 to the power of x, y equals to 2 to the power of negative x, y equals to log base 2 of x, and y equals to log base 0 0.5 of x. Pause the video here and give this question a good try. So first we have the y equals to 2 to the power x graph. It increases faster and faster from left to right and it has a y-intercept of 1. Then for y equals to 2 to the power negative x, we can use the negative index law and convert it to half to the power of x. So it has a base between 0 and 1, so it will be decreasing like this. It's actually a mirror image of the red curve along the y-axis. It also has a y-intercept of 1. Next, before we draw the log graph, we need the y equals to x line because the uh, y equals to log base 2 of x is the inverse function of 2 to the power x. So it's a mirror image across this y equals to x line. So it'll look like this, this green curve here. And you can see that it has a x intercept of 1 since log base 2 of 1 gives us 0. Lastly, we want the log base 0 0.5 of x. So this will be a reflection of the blue curve along the y equals to x line. So it will look like this in yellow. So it's decreasing, but at a slower and slower rate. Now one reason why we've been learning about these different functions, such as the polynomial function or the exponential and logarithmic function, is that these functions are very useful for modeling real-world phenomenon. So using these functions as an abstract description of concrete phenomenon, just like this scientist studying bacteria, will hopefully help the scientists quantify the pattern and make predictions. And when we test this against new observations, we will either reject the model or strengthen the reliability of this model. Now let's move on to one real world model, which is COVID. Now, in problem one, we have the number of people i infected by COVID that can be modeled by the equation i equals to i naught times e to the power of kt, where t is the time in weeks since monitoring began and k is a constant to be determined. Given that the initial cases were 30 and that there were 200 cases after three weeks, estimate part one, the number of weeks for the infected number to hit 10,000 and part two, to estimate the doubling rate in days. Pause the video here and give this question a good try. So let's make a quick sketch of the problem. Since COVID is exponential, it grows like this. And since the initial cases are 30, we can sub in i equals to 30 and t equals to 0. And this will tell us that i naught is 30. After one week, we have 200 cases, so if we sub in i equals to 200 and t equals to 1, we can find that e to the power of k gives us 20 over 3. So turning this exponential equation into a logarithmic equation, we will find that k equals to ln 20 over 3. So we need to find out how long it takes for 10,000 cases. So let's extrapolate the graph and we're going to sub in i equals to 10,000. So 10,000 will be equals to 30, the i naught, multiplied by e to the power of the k, which we know as ln 20 over 3, multiplied by t. So we just need to find t. So first, we can uh, convert the exponential equation to a logarithmic equation and make t the subject. t will be 3.06. So approximately in three weeks, we will have 10,000 cases. So in part two, we want to find the doubling rate in days. So to find this, we just need to find when the infected population reach 60, because 60 is double of the initial case of 30. And we'll just sub in i equals to 60 equals to i not 30 
times e to the power of k, which is ln 20 over 3 times t. Once again, we convert this exponential equation to a logarithmic equation, make t the subject, and we'll see that it's about 0 0.365 weeks, so multiply that by 7, that will be 2.56 days. This tells us that every 2.56 days, the number of cases double. So before we head on to the next question, I thought we should continue uh, that talk about mathematical models. I have used here an exponential model, but let's think about it again. Do you think it's a good model? Do you think that the number of infected patients will double nonstop every 2.56 days forever? Well, if you do, I have bad news for you because in 10.3 weeks, you will hit 10 billion infected patients. But Earth only has 8 billion humans, so I do not where the 2 billion extra infected are coming from. So while we try to use exponential models, and it may match the start of an epidemic, it is by no means the best model. Uh, you can look up logistics curve or compartment modeling like SIR as better ways to model a pandemic. And so you will learn these additional models as you progress through your math education. Let's look at another problem in real life, earthquakes. The Richter scale is used as a measure of the strength of an earthquake and the formula is as follow. M subscript L is equals to log base A over A naught, where ML is the Richter scale magnitude, A is the amplitude of the waves recorded on a seismograph, and A naught is the base reading. So the question is, how many times larger is the amplitude of a Richter 6.6 .6 earthquake compared to a Richter 1? Pause the video here and give this question a good try. So let's first sub in the Richter scale 1. So at ml equals to 1, you'll get log base A over A0. So the amplitude of a Richter scale 1 earthquake is equal to A0 multiplied by 10. And when the Richter scale is 6.6, .6, I can find that the amplitude of a 6.6 .6 Richter earthquake is equal to A0 multiplied by 10 to the power of 6.6. .6. So I have two equations. So we want to find the how many times stronger. So that means we will need to take the amplitude of a 6.6 .6 earthquake divided by the amplitude of a Richter 1 earthquake. So if we divide A6.6 .6 .6 over A subscript 1, that will be just 10 to the power of 6.6 .6 divided by 10 to the power of 1. So that will give us 10 to the power of 5.6, which is roughly 3.98 times 10 to the power of 5. So you can say that an earthquake uh, of Richter scale 6.6 .6 has an amplitude that is 3.98 times 10 to the power of 5 times larger than, a, than the amplitude of a Richter scale 1 earthquake. So our last problem for today is taken from the O-Levels, the, from the 2017 paper 2, question 7, and this is a question on carbon dating. Now the question goes like this. The percentage P of carbon-14 remaining in a piece of fossilized wood is given by the formula P equals to 100 e to the power of negative kT, where k is a constant to be determined, and t is measured in years. And we know the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So it takes 5,730 years for the carbon-14 to be reduced to half of the original amount. And this is through radioactive decay. So calculate the percentage of carbon-14, which would indicate a fossil age of 8,000 years. Pause the video here and give this question a good try. So initially, at t equals to zero, you have 100% of the carbon-14 content. But after 5,730 years, it's half, so P is equals to 50. So we substitute P equals to 50 and T equals to 5,730 into the formula. We get this. We divide both sides by 100. Then we make K the subject. So I'm not going to evaluate this. Instead, I'm going to substitute this into the original formula together with T equals to 8,000 because we want to see the percentage after 8,000 years. So I'll get P equals to 100 times e to the power of 8,000 over 5,730 times ln of 0 0.5, and I key this one shot into the calculator, 
I'll get 37.993. This tells me that the percentage of carbon-14 will be 38.0% to 3SF. And that's our final answer. So let's now reflect on the success criteria that we set out at the start of the lesson. Are you now able to sketch graphs of logarithmic functions of the form y equals to log base a of x for a greater than 1 and for a between 0 and 1? Are you now able to model and solve real-world problems using the exponential and logarithmic functions? So if you have any questions on any of the success criteria, you can post it in the comment section below as well. We have come to the end of the video and this chapter on logarithms. Stay tuned to the next episode of the series where we'll begin a new chapter on the binomial theorem, starting with part one of Pascal's triangles, factorials, and the combination function. Thank you and have a great day of learning.